Good morning, and uh, if you can all take your seats, please. We can get this session underway on time. Can we all take our seats, please? Okay. Uh, good morning and welcome to the uh, session, the last session before lunch, which is uh, the, the, the topic is turnaround, shifting gear from slow to fast track. And to deliver the keynote, we have uh, the Honorable Dr. Harsha De Silva, the State Minister of National Policies and Economic Affairs, I think uh, most uh, suitable to speak on this topic. Thank you, Harsha, for being here. And I also would like to welcome uh, the panelists. Captain Ravindra Javikrama, Chief Executive Officer of the Hambantori International Port Services. Dr. Liang Taoming, Chief Sales and Marketing Officer of CHEC Port City Colombo. Uh, we also have Mr. Jeevan Nyanam, who is the Director of Orion City and the Co-Founder of Hatch, Chairman Slascom. We have Shalin Balasurya, who is the manager, uh, Director and Co-Founder, Spa Ceylon, Luxury Ayurveda Spa. And last but not least, the lady, uh, uh, in the panel, Ms. Shivani Hegde, Managing Director, CEO of Nestle Lanka Private Limited. So without any further ado, may I invite you, uh, Harsha, to deliver your keynote. Thank you very much. Good morning. Ah, Jim. You are all... <laughs> Good. Um, really a privilege to stand in front of you, usually critical. Uh, try to see whether I can convince you otherwise. I'll give you the summary. The problem, the way I see it, of the growth that is stuck, or the why we can't speed up our growth is because we are not increasing exports to cover the increase in imports as growth accelerates. So in a very simplified way, that is the problem. Um, I see Arun, I don't know what his keynote was, but I'm sure he did mention these things. Because that really is the problem that we need to resolve. I, before coming to the, the Economic Affairs Ministry, was in the Foreign Ministry. And when I led delegations to Geneva and to Brussels to fight for GSP+, Plus, I realized that if we failed, the growth story would really not be one that we are trying to increase, but a growth story that probably will not going to exist. The post-war growth, how do I? Story of Sri Lanka. you see, has been quite rapid. But the issue is that acceleration was not sustainable. It was pretty much non-tradable growth. If you see the increase in the construction sector, you see how rapidly it expanded. And if you look at the manufacturing activities, you'll see it not very significant at all. However, if you look at the period after that, 14 to 16, you still see mainly non-tradable growth, which is not the solution to the problem that I described at the beginning. Of course, we see IT that's really showing some significant growth, which is very positive, but certainly not sufficient. 
if you look at the exports, you know, without comparing with anyone else, it looks pretty decent. It says, well, why are you saying that export growth hasn't been good enough? Look at this graph. You know, it's, it's really climbing. But we have to compare ourselves. Where is that mountain that we saw earlier? You can't even see it. We're almost insignificant. Because even though we grew to about $11 billion in exports, how does that compare with those countries that we compete? I'm just taking two countries here, Thailand and Vietnam, who's exporting $250 million plus. Now, if you look at the numbers, which I love to look at, our trade share dropped over time. However much people say, look, you know, the economy is expanding. Unless you are able to get the trade to GDP ratio to something significant, we are going to lose the battle. So if we are falling from trade to GDP 88% to 53% today, exposed to GDP ratio from almost 35% to 13%, and the global share, our share in the global exports from 0.08 to 0.05, you know certainly that something is wrong. You've got to turn this around. It is not possible to carry on this way and expect to meet the targets that we have set for ourselves as a nation. We need a turnaround. We have no choice. We have to change the way we do business. We can learn from our competitor countries. Yeah, it's good. We can see what they have done. But also, we can learn from ourselves. You know, if you look at the ancient history of this country, Ptolemy described Sri Lanka, then Taproban, as an island nearly of continental size. But we all know it was not of continental size. But the testimonial to the perception held by ancient travelers and merchants is because we were an important cog in trade at that time. And we don't need to go back 2,000 years. You know, we have this folk song, Parakum Yugak, Navatat Arambau, Nija Bhumita Lanka. What do we mean by that? Is it only the Parakrama Samudra that Parakrama Bahu built? Or is it something else? Of course, we all know about the Parakrama Samudra and what he did with agriculture. But he created a total export hub here. I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to read the great Parakrama Bahu's reign from about 1153 to 1180 or something like that. I want to read a couple of paragraphs. You know, the Chula Vansa was written in the 13th century. And Parakrama Bahu was king in the 12th century. So we believe, historians believe, there's a whole lot of accuracy in what is in this book. Unrestricted exports of elephants from Burma to foreign countries had always been allowed. And there were many merchants in Burma engaged in the trade. King Aluang Situ, however, made the trade in elephants a royal monopoly 
and dramatically increased the price to be paid for them. He also discontinued the practice of presenting elephants to Sri Lankan ships. So he created a bit of a distortion in the free market of trade in elephants. And what happened after that? And I'm reading from the translation and also something that was written by Vijayavadana quoting K.M. De Silva and others. According to Chula Vansa, Lanka had been buying Burmese elephants for 30 silver coins per elephant. And the king of Burma had, without pre-announcement, stopped selling elephants to Lankan shippers. When he finally permitted the sale of elephants to Lanka, the price had been raised from, from about, or to about 1,000 to 3,000 silver coins, making it completely prohibitive. Annoyed by these unilateral restrictions to trade, King Parakrambaho invaded Burma to re-establish trade links with that country. So I'm just reading off this to reiterate the fact that in the days where this country was prosperous, we were prosperous because we were engaged in global trade. Historians show that coins from China to Persia to Egypt to Greece were all found in the period of Parakramabahu in Sri Lanka. The story is, in fact, he started with alcohol trade. I don't have time to go into that now. But Chulavansa says that he brought alcohol and he wanted to make sure that he had the monopoly to sell alcohol and also to make sure people were not too drunk. <laughs> of course, you don't have to get, be stuck in the 12th century. There on afterwards, we know how Sri Lanka moved during the colonial period also in be to becoming a um, export uh, nation. But the traditional exports that we still continue to talk about is not going to help us win this battle or to the, achieve the turnaround that we require. We need diversification and complexity. I'm going to show you a few slides and these slides I borrowed from Harvard CID, Atlas of Economic Complexity. What I want you to take a look at are the colors, coffee, tea, cocoa, crude rubber. That was our diversification in 1965. If you look at the diversification in 1990, we brought in apparels, of course, tea, spices, they all are still there. Look at 2015, apparels have sort of become quite big, but still, e, spices, rubber, all those traditional and low complex products. Now compare that with a country like Thailand. How their export diversification happened from 65 to 90. You see the blue is important because they are manufactured items. The light blue is even more important because it's electronics and IT. And look at what happens in 2015. Their original exports have almost become insignificant and the blues have taken over. Electronics, office equipment, transport uh, items and so on. Vietnam, another country that's doing extremely well. And look at how the transformation has happened. In 90, they had hardly any blues, but look at 2015. It's all about electronics and uh, higher uh, value added products. So if you look at all three countries, what you see is that over time, those competitor countries, they shifted from where they were to a 
pretty comfortable position now to take on the challenges in the future. I want you to take a, a look at this slide which I again borrowed from Harvard CID. What does it show? It shows the uh, composition of new products in our export baskets. Red, pink are new ones, meaning first year it showed up in the global atlas of merchandise trade. Red is, it first showed up in 2000. Pink is, it first showed up in 1990. So these countries on your right have a lot of red and pink in them. What does it mean? It means they have moved on from traditional products to new products. They've diversified from rubber and tea and cocoa and coconut to electronics and IT and wire harnesses and complex products. And three percentage points come from these products. And I'm going to give you an example that you're going to hold your head in your hands. Sri Lanka. I'll give you an example for Tha Taiwan, Thailand. In the last 15 years, Thailand introduced 70 new products that showed up in the Atlas, the Harvard Atlas is what's called the RCA, meaning there is some significant amount of trade taking place. 70 new products per capita $326. Vietnam, 48 products and each bringing in $545 per capita. And Sri Lanka, seven new products bringing in $5 per capita. Now you see, unless we make some changes, this is not sustainable. So how do we do it? It hasn't happened naturally. The more we look inwards, the more we say we don't want to integrate, the further we are going to be away from our target. We need technical expertise. We need investments. I want to go back to Ricardo, who mentioned this a couple of times, taking Scrabble as an analogy. Right? So, knowledge, expertise, or know-how is crucial for growth and development. So think of a letter or unit as know-how and a word as a product. So if you have three words, SRI, you can get two products. Every community, every country, every home is limited by the knowledge and the know-how that unit has. So in this case, you can make sir and Sri, if Sri is a word. If you had Sri Lanka, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight were letters, that much of know-how, but of course it is repeated. Then you can make 182 words. And more valuable words, longer words, that you can get double score and triple score in Scrabble. So if we are restricted by policies of the state or the attitudes of the people or the chance of the opposition that we must close this country and keep away the technology that comes in, which is absolutely essential to move from a simple low productive country to a complex high productive and high wage country, then we can forget about it. Another very important point that I want to make is that we talk about production networks. I'm sure we heard this before. Production networks have two 
different types of production networks. I refer to an amazingly rich paper by our friend Premachandra Tukorala. Can download it. Manufacturing exports from Sri Lanka opportunities, achievements, and policy options at the ANU. Who talks about the need to move from buyer driven to producer driven production networks? Now, what are we talking about? Trade is dynamic and in intra industry value chains, meaning intermediate goods are the ones that trade the most. You heard the explanation or rather the example of the Apple phone and so on, how many times it moves borders before it is actually finalized and sold in the retail store. And it moves as intermediate product. Right? So these numbers are from the global merchandise trade. Now in the case of Buyer-driven is you have a buyer, the buyer tells you, this is what I want, can you produce it for me? Yes, sure, we can do it, here it is. Now, if what we are producing can be produced in 100 other countries and we are competing only on price, as the country grows, as we develop, as our wages rise, can we compete? We cannot. Some of you yourselves have moved your operations to other countries that wages are much cheaper than here. So it is risky to be in buyer-driven networks. We need to move to producer-driven production networks. Producer-driven networks are more technology and capital intensive with technology and production expertise needed in-house. So that is where we are looking at FDIs, that is where we are looking at uh, um, innovations locally or otherwise with uh, copyright and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Ownership of knowledge. Yeah. 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 Five minutes. Yeah. So if you look at the contribution of buyer driven networks versus producer driven networks and look at Sri Lanka compared to these countries, you see that it is of critical importance that we shift gears. So coming to the end, what are we doing? We are going to engage in greater trade and investment agreements. There are people who are even criticizing the Singapore FTA. And I tell those people, please don't be misled by cheap political nonsense. We need the investments to come in. We need to lower the border taxes so that the production networks can become a reality in this country. We need to lower the barriers that we have erected at the borders. If we erect a barrier at the border, it becomes less conducive to become a part of the network. It will go to another country that has lower barriers at the border. So that is why we are removing para tariffs and border restrictions. The new immigration regulations are coming. The cabinet has approved it. We will have visas that will help uh, companies employ specialists and others. That will help transfer technology either within FTAs or outside FTAs. Special economic zones, of course, Port City folks are here, Hambantota folks are here, Bingiria, Charlie Mount, Trinkamali, 
various other special economic zones will come up, sustainable investment incentives without giving carte blanche tax incentives for the rest of the life of the company. A 200% capital allowance or 300% capital allowance allows you, if you invest $100 million, $50 million, let's say $100 million, that you don't have to pay any taxes until you make $200 million in profits or $300 million in profits if you are investing in difficult areas in the North. Ease of doing business reforms, innovation and entrepreneurship. So the last slide, I'm not going to go deep into this, but the national export strategy has been launched by the, the, the MODSIT and they've identified ITM and BPM services, electrical and electronic components, boating, boat industry, wellness tourism, processed food and beverages, spices and concentrates. I'm not necessarily saying that these would be the ones that will take us from where we are to the diversified complex market that we are looking for. But at least the EDB has done research to determine that these might be good bets. So to end from where I started, it is about integrating, it is about shifting gears from inward looking to outward looking, it is about taking the challenge on and it is certainly not about erecting more walls around this country. It is certainly not the way forward. Shifting gears has to be something that is meaningful to us so that ultimately this will help our people improve their standard of living. This is just a a slide that I put to show that Sri Lanka is still not yellow, it's still white. Soon all these countries will get together. It is called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. If we can't even sign one agreement with one country, how are we going to sign agreements with ASEAN plus six countries? So think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harsha. Harsha, it's very in interesting that uh, you have been chosen to deliver this top, uh, uh, talk. Uh, I mean, you were Deputy Minister for Finance, uh, Foreign Affairs, and then moved on to uh, national policies, and I think that's very appropriate, given your background. Um, now, uh, you spoke about exports, but in the last uh, three years that since your government has taken office, if you look at the metrics, uh, they don't give a very promising picture. Uh, trade deficit is up. External debt has grown, growth rate is hovering around 3%, rural economy contribution to GDP is declining, spending on education as a percentage of GDP that your government promised would be 6 is hovering at 2 the same for health, and most frighteningly, in the Global Competitiveness Index, we have slipped from 68th to 85th, while all other countries in South Asia, Bhutan has gone up 15 places, Nepal 10, Pakistan 7, Bangladesh 7. So in keeping the topic of fast track, I would think far from gathering steam and forging ahead, it looks like the train is stuttering and hardly left the station. Now, you spoke about exports and I'm glad you spoke about the, the CDI, uh, uh, the CID, uh, uh, which is a study that you, your government commissioned, I believe. And they speak about exports and you did say about Vietnam, 45 goods, we had seven, so they have grown their exports 35-fold. Now, one of the things that the same report points out, and this is appropriate because you're state minister for policy, is that they talk about binding constraints, those constraints that if you focus on and improve even marginally, you will have tremendous impact on growth. Now, the thing they say is, the business in Sri Lanka faces serious constraint from frequent and unpredictable changes in tax policy, extending to trade policy, and to a lesser extent to land policy. Now, why is this government not able to have consistent policy around some of these key issues? And that has been flagged as a binding constraint. Peter. <laughs> 
running a company is difficult. Running a coalition government is extremely difficult. You must realize that when we came to office, we made certain promises of delivering what we call good governance and taking this country to where it belongs. You cannot completely forget about the good things that have happened and point out a bunch of negatives. Peter, when no, 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 I, I went... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, see, the thing is, I mean, it, it, it's good to talk about the good things, but the people are only talking about numbers. And I've asked you a specific question on policy. I am, because I'm, you see, I'm going to we, answer a specific question. The only no, reason answer, is because we have a very ask, short time. You asked me, yeah. ask me a long policy. question. Let me, let, policy. No, let me, a let binding po constraint. Policy, exactly. Foreign policy is important if you are going to become an integrated part of global trade. If you are fighting with the world, you cannot become a part of the part of that that uh, that um, uh, marketplace. If you are fighting with Europe and Europe has taken away your GSP plus, which means it gives us 12 to 15 percent tariff reduction or complete uh, removal of tariffs, it is difficult to export to Europe. If you're fighting with the UN and you have a problem with the Human Rights Council, they were going to slam uh, economic sanctions on Sri Lanka. If economic sanctions were put on Sri Lanka, you think we are going to be talking here about increasing exports? No. We're going to be talking about how are we going to get our uh, pharmaceutical drugs. But I don't so misunderstand the question, Harsha. The question specifically is, uh, the, and this is from the very CID report that you Harvard studied that your government, I believe, uh, you know, sanctioned. Now, the, they are saying unpredictable changes in policy. This has nothing to do with GSP. They go on to say, important changes to tax policy are seen as ad hoc, and policy reversals and unclear implementation of policy changes are the norm. Isn't that damning for a government that is supposed to you know, have consistency in policy? That's all. And you are the state minister for policy, national policy. Why can't it be consistent? No, I am not saying that this government has been perfect. Nobody is perfect. We are trying to manage within a coalition. We have brought this country personal freedoms that you can question me like this without worrying about getting picked up by a white man in the night. You can criticize me. Those are essential. Now, you talk about tax policy. Tax policy, we have come up with a brand new inland revenue uh, legislation. Okay, how Are you very certain that that will remain? It will remain because we made sure that the minister can't change it. We made sure that, of course, some people are critical. There are teething problems. Certain things will be taken to parliament all together, hopefully in the next month or so, and revised. Pay tax divisions will come. Uh, further revisions to investment relief will come. They have already been agreed upon. On the unpredictability, I think people can criticize, and of course changes have happened, policies that have been uh, formulated and presented to Parliament have been changed. I'm not saying otherwise. Okay. Okay. So just to uh, get back to back on track, uh, I thought I'd just start off with a question. Uh, so the other panelists, would you all be so kind as to take three minutes or so and give us your opening statement on the topic as you see it from the industries and businesses that you are running? Uh, Jeevan, you want to go first? Charlie, why don't we take take it in sequence? Yes. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So. Taking from uh, what Dr. Harsha said, and I'll, I'll, I'll make it as relevant as possible to where I come from. So just to make clear, um, I'm from Spacelon, and uh, we are, our brand is, um, we're not just a spa operator, we're actually a, a producer, and we're a, a retail chain that operates in over 14 countries now. And looking at um, the export side of things uh, that Dr. Harsha pointed out, um, I too personally believe that diversification is the way forward. And um, 
that diversification uh, has to happen, and for that diversification to happen effectively, the SMEs have to come and play their part. And when we started off as SME, that is exactly what we did. We took something, which was Ayurveda, which was on, in, on the, in this country for 5,000 plus years, and we took it, we tweaked it, we made it relevant to a modern audience, we took it to a point that it could be exported and it could create traction in exports and managed to make it a successful export and it's still growing. So for the, for when we're looking for a product, we don't always have to look at technology. We don't always have to look at something, bringing something from outside and creating something. There are also a lot of opportunities within this country, but we need to start identifying and understanding who our consumer is, who the global consumer is, and then ensure that our product is taken to a point that it makes sense to the global con consumer, that it makes sense that it, that it can go to a global market and stand out, and that there is uniqueness. We need to focus on our branding. We, we're very happy to do commodities, uh, but for SMEs, you have to start looking at branding. We have to start putting our money and our mind to branding so that we can go out and stand out and be unique. And only when we stand out and be unique, um, Harsha said this as well, that we can start demanding premiums. And then we also become a little more robust. We, are, we become uh, resilient to um, changes in, in, in our economic system. So the building of brands, we started building Spa Ceylon nine years ago. And we did it in spite of everything that was happening in the country. So it could be economic policies changing. It could be other factors changing. It could be the fact that there was no proper infrastructure for a brand of our, our, our type. But we, where infrastructure was needed, where supply chains were needed, we went and built them. Where perceptions were not right, we went and changed them. Where we needed to build uh, what 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 was required to propel the brand forward, we went and did it ourselves. And being in a small country, it allows you to do it if you only make a little more effort. So I think a key thing for SMEs is, is to start looking at brands uh, and start looking at it in a global sense when you start constructing your brands here, putting it together, incubating it in Sri Lanka, and bringing it to a point where you can take it out. Thank you, Shalin. Uh, Jivan, you want to have a um, take so on the subject? Yeah, I'll, I'll focus on the kind of IT industry, and uh, right now it's about 1.2 billion, uh, where we've had a compounded annual growth rate of about 28% uh, year on year. Uh, our target is to reach 5 billion by 2022, uh, which means just in the next year um, we have to reach about 1.8 billion. Um, and that's adding about 500 million to, to the basket, you know, uh, to, to our exports uh, in, in, in this next year. So this year, um, if you look at the numbers of what we need to do, we need to, uh, that, that means we need to go from, um, you know, about 7,000 graduates that we lost. Um, in 2012, we had 7,000 gra IT graduates in, uh, coming out. We need to employ about 16,000 uh, 16, people in the industry. Um, so th there's, uh, I, I think, you know, there's a, a, a requirement, um, there's, there's undersupply of, of, of good people. And also what's happening in the IT industry, um, we see that it's evolving very quickly. So this year we're giving priority. Um, I'm really pushing forward uh, kind of data science and AI. Um, and when we look at kind of the education system in, in Sri Lanka, um, not this is not being really taught in, in universities and stuff like that. As a result, um, uh, I think SLASCOM has had to kind of go to the universities, come up with programs, um, for example, with, with the University of Colombo, where we have uh, you know, six-month programs where data science graduates are being, uh, are, are being put out. Um, so really to reach numbers, I think uh, we've come up with some solutions, working with universities, trying to build capacity. Uh, this year, to add to that diversification uh, strategy that Harsha spoke about, we're really focusing on kind of um, data science, where traditionally uh, IT has focused on software development and finance and accounting. We're really adding to that third pillar around statisticians, 
um, and, and bringing in some um, com computer skills as well to give, give us good data scientists. Um, and I think that's kind of been our priority this, this year. Thank you, Shivani. So I'd like to touch upon the point of uh, building um, agronomic resilience in the country. Uh, and particularly for countries like Sri Lanka, where about 80% of the population is living in the rural areas, while there is a strong case for urbanization, there is an equally strong case for building thriving and resilient rural communities. And um, we know that uh, agriculture uh, today accounts for about 30% of the employment in the country, but generates about 8% of the GDP. And it was also very sensitive to changes in weather conditions. Uh, we heard this morning that Sri Lanka is one of the top 10 in terms of vulnerability, and therefore the need for us to build a more resilient rural community comes up. And most of the developments that are taking place today, not just here, but in most emerging countries, are happening in the urban area, whether it's technological advancements, investments, etc. And I do believe there's a strong case for us to increase productivity and increase the investments that we make in rural communities as well. Uh, let me talk specifically about three areas where I believe that the rural economy can contribute towards fast-tracking uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, the first is in the area of import substitution, and we've heard a lot about increasing exports and reducing our import bill. And uh, we know that over the years, uh, Sri Lanka has been able to achieve self-sufficiency in rice. I think with the work that is happening today, we can do the same with dairy. And uh, with private part, uh, public partnerships, it is possible for us to increase our self-sufficiency when it comes to dairy as well. The second area is in terms of identifying uh, and producing um, more uh, value-added export products which come from the agricultural sector. We have today built up a brand of Sri Lankan tea. We can do the same by building a brand of Sri Lankan coconut or maybe some other products. And this is how the agricultural sector and increased productivity could help us to diversify our export portfolio as well. Lastly, of course, we also have the opportunity for certain geographies and certain provinces uh, like the north and the east, where I think we can exploit the, uh, explore the, um, the export potential there, the agri-potential there, and those rural economies can also help us to drive growth. Thank you. Captain, you want to? Um, I would say uh, our parent company has invested almost uh, 1.1 billion US dollars in uh, leasing out the Hambantota port. Now, um, the question is, why have they gone and invested so much money in a backward area like Hambantota? Uh, the company has been very upbeat about their investment in Colombo. Um, the port of Colombo, the south terminal, was telescoped from a 60-month construction period to 33 months. And the terminal has achieved its uh, rated throughput within a short period of three years, instead of coming up to their 100% capacity by 2020, as was uh, the expected, we have achieved that by 2017, 2018. Now, all this was possible because the Chinese company fast-tracked their development to cater to the demand that Sri Lankan ports required. So, Hambantota now is ready to fast track itself to the community at large and to uh, facilitate export promotion by uh, opening up our land for industries, industrialists to come and invest and start up their business ventures in the Hambantota port. It's a free trade zone and anybody could come and invest there and start off their operations. Now, saying that, we do have a lot of drawbacks. One of the major drawbacks that everybody has been talking about is the level of education that we have in our country. Is the people in that area, are they not capable of living up to our requirements as far as employment is concerned? Everybody is asking for jobs, but they want jobs in the government sector, not in the private sector. When the port was leased out, the 
Ports Authority or the Magampura Port at that time had 450 employees under them. And when we offered them jobs, hardly anybody took up the offer. They all wanted to join the public sector. That's the Sri Lanka Ports Authority. Unfortunately, out of 450, only 17 opted to join the company. All the others wanted to go to the public sector. So that is one of the major drawbacks that we are having in that area. And in addition to that, the, uh, uh, the shackles that a port operator that has just joined the fray in Sri Lanka is also pretty bad. So I would really hope that all these shackles will be taken off in the very near future. We are going in for a one-stop shop as far as the BOI is concerned in Hambantota so that anybody does not have to go down to Colombo and we don't have to travel up from Hambantota to Colombo to get our businesses done. So people could come down to Hambantota to get their businesses done. Thank you. Tommy? Hi, morning. Um, let me just take this opportunity to give all of you an update on the uh, status of the Port City project. Um, from the construction point of view, um, we have done more than 90% of the reclamation. And from the uh, construction of the brick water, we are at about 70%, only because of the monsoon season, which will end pretty soon, um, which once it's ended, uh, we can resume the construction of the brick water. So we are expected to complete reclamation and marine engineering work by the middle of next year. What we have also done is that uh, two months ago, we have started on the city infrastructure works. So if you go onto site right now, you'll probably see a few trees being planted. Um, we are trying to test plant trees on our um, reclamation at this point in time. So in terms of city infrastructure, it's divided into two Phases. First phase, which is the eastern half of the project, nearer to the existing city, um, will be completed by the end of 2020, which means that the roads will be done, the parks will be done, the utility connections will be done, and so on and so forth. The next part of what we are trying to do now is really to attract investments into the port city which is basically what we've been discussing a lot this morning in terms of FDI, in terms of domestic investments. Um, <clears throat> these investments are highly dependent on the economic policies of the country. I recall many years back, there was a particular businessman from my country who won the Businessman of the Year Award. He was uh, quite well courted by this country as well, I, I noticed. Um, and in his winning speech, he said, my success was really dependent on the coat tiers, riding on the coat tiers of the country. Which basically means that where he gets to today was highly dependent on the national economic policies of the country that he, uh, of my country. So that's Singapore, right? Um, the same will apply to the port city. While we are infrastructure developers, all right, what we can produce, if I can draw an analogy, if you look at the glass on your table, we can produce that glass. How are we going to fill it with water depends on the policies of the country. The project is targeted towards the region. The size of the project itself uh, is basically 5.7 million square meters of built space. What does that mean? Half of this space is for residential, and that translates to 21,600 units. 21,600 units is, I just did a very quick mental calculation, more than 50 times of what Shangri-La has built in terms of their residential towers. In terms of commercial office, it's 1.5 million square meters. And that's the same as the whole of Canary Wharf in London. 750,000 square meters of retail space, that's 16 of Shangri-La retail mall. So that's the magnitude of the project. And we have to find people to fill up this space. 
So, from slow to fast is something which I think uh, we are very interested in because we really have to hasten the space. All right? And I think having said this, uh, we are looking forward to the challenge ahead of us. Okay? And um, over the next couple of years, you will see the port city coming to life and uh, getting filled up. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, just a quick uh, um, instruction. Don't forget to open your app and post your questions because I'll have a few questions from the audience, uh, from, from myself, and then we'll turn to, turn to your questions. So please send those questions in through the app. Thank you. Uh, I'll start a bit um, with you, Shivani. Uh, rural economy. Now, uh, sadly, the rural economy in this country is only contributing 6% uh, to the overall economy. And uh, that also has seen a decline since 2006, when we were at about 11%, I think. Um, if I, if I, yeah, in, yeah, we were. Now, uh, the economy says, intelligence unit says, that focusing on building rural economy can contribute as much as 13% growth to the overall, you know, contribution of the rural economy. Now, what specifically is Nestle doing? Because I'd like to pose, pose it directly to you, in terms of building uh, rural, uh, the, the rural economy in this country. Well, um as you rightly said, I think in, in many other agrarian uh, economies, the agricultural sector can contribute as much as uh, 14 to 17% of the GDP. And uh, one of the specific areas is, uh, is to make the rural communities more resilient, uh, to make them have a more stable uh, income. And that is the area where specifically we have been working and also towards building uh, the point I raised about building self-sufficiency in the area of uh, dairy. So uh, it was almost 30 years ago that uh, Nestle made a commitment that we would, uh, we would support the rural communities in the country, uh, working with them on a daily basis, working with the farmers, providing them with technical expertise, microfinancing, uh, bringing in best practices, and um, at the same time also providing them with a route to market so that their produce uh, could reach the urban areas. And today we work with 20,000 dairy farmers. Uh, we have been able to increase the, the quantity as well as the quality of milk in the country. And this is thanks to the work that the government is doing in collaboration with dairy companies like us. So uh, more specifically, uh, uh, then uh, going into another area that we are doing is in the area of coconut farmers. Uh, we have started working with uh, coconut farmers because we realized that with the vulnerability of uh, weather conditions, uh, we had uh, an issue uh, last year with the, with the crops, crop failure. And we are now working with, uh, with the farming community, the coconut farming community, to extend the cultivation beyond the coconut triangle, providing them with saplings, providing them with fertilizers, etc., so that we have a more sustainable and uh, resilient community. Any specific numbers you might have? Because it's all about grow slow to fast track uh, without being you know, abstract. I was wondering whether you have any numbers that shows the development of the rural dairy farming community. Do you have any numbers to support that? Well, when we started work, uh, Sri Lanka was largely an importer of, of milk uh, products, milk powder, etc. Today, we meet about 50% of our uh, requirements locally. Okay. So even coconut, your production is all for local consumption? Coconut is an area which is a, is, is a tremendous potential, as I mentioned, not just for domestic, but also for the export sector. And uh, the opportunity to provide value-added export products. Uh, Sri Lankan coconut is already gaining a reputation of being one of the best. And uh, 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 countries like uh, ours can take the opportunity to have more value-added products in coconut. Okay. Thank you. Jeevan, uh, the minister also alluded to one of the pillars of the economic uh, strategy. Uh, I mean, the export uh, strategy is around IT. You did spell out the challenges you have. Uh, firstly, my first question is, is it too ambitious to have a number like 5 billion when you are at 1.2, you have 75,000 employees, you say that to make 5 billion, you need to have another, uh, you have to go up to 200,000. And uh, with the kind of uh, spend that we're having on education and the wrong type of education, um, I'm sure you're going to be challenged. So first question, are you looking at revalidating these numbers because when we started SLASCOM uh, 10 years ago, uh, the number was 3 billion uh, in, in, by 20, in, in 2015 or something like that. So first question is that. Secondly, what, are you, what, is, what is the overall economic policy that's in place to ensure 
that you have the raw material, so to speak, to go after this number of five billion. Because a billion to five is a daunting task for any industry, let alone an industry that relies entirely on people and skills, for which we are clearly not investing. Good question. Um, I think uh, I don't, I, I, one of the reasons why I mentioned our focus on uh, data science and AI is that we're looking, um, if you look at the average revenue per employee today, it's about $24,000 per year. Um, if you look at um, data science and AI, that could significantly go up, um, you know, to $60,000 to $100,000 uh, an employee. So where you don't need as much people um, um, to reach that $200,000 uh, uh, employee number that we originally spoke about. Um, so that's why I have given priority to kind of focusing on data science and AI. But let me speak about a few other, th other things that, you know, I think Slascom's giving priority to this year, right? To reach um, and, 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 what, and, what, and give you some context as, as well of why that $5 billion number is, is uh, I think, achievable. Um, if you look at India, obviously much larger than us, uh, but obvious uh, does about 168 billion. Uh, if you take one state uh, in, in, in India, which is uh, maybe Gurgaon, Delhi, does about 25 to 30 billion. So I think as a country, if we can't do 5 billion, we're not really doing right by ourselves. Um, and and I, I think where also there's some success stories. Uh, I mean, um, you know, you would think uh, Malaysia as a country is doing phenomenally well, right? With with infrastructure, uh, you know, all, all what they have. I mean, I'll just pass a question to you. How how big do you think is the Malaysian I IT BPM export? I I'm not sure of the number. Go okay, ahead. but it's it's roughly 400 million. So I mean, um, ev even though with the, with the, with these with the amount of noise they make, I think we're we're bigger um, than Malaysia at least at this point because of the people that we have. Um, and I think that's our biggest strength is is the people. I thought the point was that the people capacity is not what you are building. Yeah, we, well, I think um, th there is a mixture of. I mean, the uh, literacy rate and all doesn't cut it, right? To do this kind of work. Yeah. So I think I, I was going to make another point of um, where technology um, kind of democrat democratizes education, right? Today, if you want a degree from MIT, you don't have. You can go online and get it. Right. Um, if you want to be a data scientist today, you can you can go on Coursera and you can become a data scientist. You can become a certified da data scientist. Slascom is working with Coursera to try and, and, and get um, you know preferential rates for Slascom companies to to go in to go into Coursera and, and, and get get data science courses. We're working with the universities to increase um, the number of data scientists uh, this year. So um, I think uh, there is a there is a capacity problem, but we are trying to work within what we best have and the tools that we have to address address that. And I'll turn that to you, Harsha, and uh, now, now, now don't do go hard at me, because <laughs> I, I, my job is to ask you tough questions, and, and you, are, you are capable of answering them. Uh, and I've always been on the front line, the picket lines, uh, from the ch time I was 15 years old. So despite the white van syndrome, I've survived. So, so that's okay. Uh, I like your mean look, uh, which, <laughs> Uh, which we are now cultivated, so. <laughs> uh, but but uh, go easy on me, okay? Right. Now, the question to you is, specifically because exports is, uh, is, is a matter that you, it's close to your heart, and this is one of the pillars. Can you very specifically say, being an economist, not a politician, uh, the challenges that economies face when you try to scale an industry from 1.2 to 5 billion, and the underlying factors you look at. So purely as an economist, I'm asking you a question, what should you do to provide that kind of capacity so that we don't just get carried away with numbers without the underlying uh, you know, raw material elements that support it? So what, what do you think you can do to make them achieve that number given all the challenges we spoke about? A company can grow organically. It can grow slowly. But it can also merge and acquire other companies and grow faster. How did Vietnam grow to $250 million, billion dollars of exports when they were below us just 15, 20 years ago? How did they do it? You think the Vietnamese education system is better than ours? No, ours is better than theirs. Then how did they do it? 
I spoke about letters and words. We are restricted by the knowledge that we have. We can proudly say we are knowledgeable, we are literacy rates are high and so on. But if you are trying to build complex products, we need to network, we need to open, we need to merge and acquire, we need to have people come in and go out. So the way to do it is to have policies that allow that technology experts, that know-how, the knowledge to flow in. And that can happen in two ways. One is you enter into investment and trade agreements like the one we did with, with Singapore and what we are planning to do with other countries. Another is leave the, the trade agreements aside, but relax immigration laws. How many people who started companies in Silicon Valley were born in California? <laughs> I think less than 10%. Right? How did uh, New Zealand grow? How does uh, Singapore grow? We have to think about integrating. So when I say integrating, what I mean is we are going to create policies, which is what which is what I said, we are refining policies. I mean, how are we going to fill the port city? I mean, are we going to organically grow this country to fill port city? That which is a ridiculous question. Is which uh, actually uh, turns to the question, so is that the right investment? Is the, is the obvious question then we need to ask. I mean, it's a quite uh, uh, interesting that you spoke about uh, uh, the, 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 the making a glass and then filling it. Now, it's a little frightening, isn't it, that we are gone ahead to make the glass without really being sure. It sounds like uh, some crazy idea from a bad movie. Uh, I mean, uh, there are many cities in, in China that have now become ghost cities. Yeah, they are unable to fill. Will the port city become a ghost city? Well, I think it all starts with uh, vision. You have to really look at the location and ask yourself whether there's some potential in it. Um, I think the Prime Minister in the, the economic, uh, World Economic Forum, January 2016, has stated it very well. It says that if you look at between Dubai and Singapore, there is a void of financial centers, and Sri Lanka just happened to be right in the middle of that. Um, if you look at the whole of South Asia region, there isn't really a credible financial center. Is there one? Sorry? No, no. In the South Asia region, right? So there isn't one. And that's Dubai has served the Middle East very well. And Singapore has served Southeast Asia very well. Surely there must be a huge market in South Asia that needs to be serviced. Who's doing it? Nobody. Now, the point here is that when we look at the location of Sri Lanka, I just got back from Mumbai yesterday, last night. All right? And if you take a flight within an hour, out of the six major Indian cities, you reach three of them. Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad. 450 million in population. Five states within southern India. A huge market. Who's servicing them? The Indians are now parking their money in Dubai. 25% of the money that's parked in Mauritius comes from India. Why can't we have a share of the market? I have been here for almost four years. And during my four years here, I've spoken to a number of people, including expatriates that are based in India, major cities in India. And they would tell you that, you know, they would relocate to Colombo if they have that opportunity to. The point here is that the companies that they work for 
doesn't see the kind of commercial office infrastructure they need to relocate to Colombo. Just to interrupt you, uh, but is it about infrastructure? Isn't it, I mean, to build a financial city, it's not like building, putting up buildings. Does Sri Lanka have the capacity and the policy and the, you know, the, the long-term vision to turn a city into a financial city? I mean, it takes more than putting up buildings, doesn't it? I mean, do we have the people? Do we have the consistency of policy? I mean, they nearly shut down the project uh, when the government came in and said this looks like a bad investment. So my point is to fill the glass, I mean, we are talking about building the glass, I get that. You're building many glasses. But what does it take and do we have it uh, to fill the glass is my question. I think it's a mixture of infrastructure policies, all right, the um, workforce itself and so on and so forth. So there are many, many different factors that's required over here. Infrastructure is one of them. Are the policies in place to attract finance to a capital? They are work in progress right now. Okay. Okay. Right. Can I can I just yes, comment please. because you said the uh, government almost shut it down. <laughs> what we objected to was the sale of fifty acres of real estate Absolutely. in the uh, CBD to the company. Mm -hmm. That is what we objected. By and large, there were other issues. And the cost? What cost? The cost, the estimated uh, no cost. valuation? Valuation. No, it's an investment. There is no cost. No, no, yeah, no, the no, valuation. No, no, I mean, yeah. no, okay. no. We, okay. We, we right, okay, let's yeah. keep going. Keep our, our issue yeah. was security yeah. related. Okay, go ahead. And then it was renegotiated. It was renegotiated. The company does not own anything. It's a, it's a lease and it's going to be, I'm the chairman of the soft infrastructure steering committee. So we are finalizing, like he said, the legal uh, infrastructure and the, the incentive infrastructure. So the platforms are getting ready. The, the laws are now being reviewed by top global law firms. Uh, we've done two, three rounds of uh, reviews. The investment, infra investment uh, incentives are pretty much agreed upon. We just need to uh, make it public, but we will do it at the right time. Like he said, it's work in progress. We are confident. But one thing you must note is there is no water to fill this glass locally. We're not looking at a local enterprise here. We, this is an international financial center. This is the most unique piece of real estate in this part of the world. And like he said, Half of the property is for nice living. It's yacht marinas, it's entertainment, it's convention centers, it's the world's best schools, it's the world's best hospitals, and so on and so forth. But you will exclude a large percent of percentage of our population from this, from this activity, wouldn't it? I mean, this is, looks like a playground for the rich and the famous. Is this the right priority, again, as an economist? If you were to make decisions, if there was no port city when you took power, if you were to make a uh, decision, Harshan, I, I ask you to be honest about this. As an economist, would this be your priority to fast track an agricultural economy like Sri Lanka, largely agricultural based, but not necessarily into the future? Would this be a priority as an economist to build the future of this country and for its large majority of its people? You see, as a sovereign nation, we have the right to do as we please. However, we are a player in a bigger global community. We have diplomatic relations. We have, uh, you know, credibility to maintain. Doesn't matter, it was the previous government who started it. We changed the project from golf courses and entertainment related race tracks to a financial city, to a knowledge city. So we changed the, the entire concept of it. And that is what we are progressing. So. That question is a little bit unfair because the gentleman had started the project. It was uh, inaugurated by uh, Mr. Xi Jinping himself, and there was no uh, sort of saying, look, you know, we are going to stop it. It was change it to suit the requirements, and as long as we had understanding, 
uh, we could have gone in. But the only reason I asked the question was that uh, both Malaysia and Pakistan now are pulling out of these projects because they feel that they were ill-conceived and they were not the, in the best interest of their own country. So we leave it at that because we'll have asked questions from the audience. They, they, they were loans. This is not a loan. This is, this is an investment. Mahathir yeah, stopped a 200 billion loan. Yes. Yeah, maybe if I can add to that. The port city itself as a financial city is expected to create some 83,000 job opportunities within the project itself. The bulk of these job opportunities, I would safely say more than 90% of these, would go to the locals. These are high value paying jobs. All right? um, and basically what we need here is to bring certain skills all right, from the expatriate community to come here and help establish the financial center. And I think Jim would be able to testify to that, what is required. Okay, and what, how I think Sri Lanka will benefit from this. Number one, you're talking about job opportunities. I recall some two years ago when I went to uh, Kandy on a trip to see the Parahara. And uh, after that, I, I mean, went I'm to- I'm sorry, I am so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I know you're you, you born to elaborate on this point, but given that we have 15 minutes and there are a bunch of questions, may I kindly, uh, you know, move on? Sure. Next question. Okay. I did take the point you made that it will create jobs and it will require certain special skills and hopefully we are building those skills to provide that. Skills yeah. transfers as well? Yes. yes. Okay. So the question, I'll just go in a sequence. Uh, uh, there's a question here from Harsha Purasinghe. It says, Harsha's last slide, that's you, Harsha, uh, was about economic cooperation in ASEAN and Pacific, Pacific region. However, one key challenge doing business in the region is due to challenges in obtaining visas. What actions in place to change this situation towards improving mobility in the region for ease of doing business? And if you can keep your answer short, all of you, uh, I'll appreciate because of time. Harsha, you know, we can't, it is always reciprocal, right? So if we have a particular visa regime that is reciprocated by the other country, usually that's how it works. So what I also had in the penultimate slide was the new immigration uh, 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 revisions. So there, it will become very much more easier for people to come and get employment visa. Uh, and there is going to be a specific node that will clear uh, these visas. They don't have to go uh, from pillar to post. The one entity that will look at all the, the necessary requirements and issue two-year visas and so on. So once we uh, are able to uh, make it easier for others to come in, it will make it easier for us to go there as well. Like I said, it's reciprocal. Okay, there's another question from Aruna Utpala. Dr. Harsha, to make some new innovations, we already have institutes like Slintech with huge investment to do wonders in technology. But the communication to SMEs or local community on the capabilities and opportunities are not conveyed. The good things government does uh, does not pass to the right people which need to build a proper communication system and alert the right communities. What are the avenues for linking right partners with right potential? I mean, yeah, that is a criticism leveled against us. You know, we don't talk enough about the good things. And Slintech is an absolutely fantastic thing. And, you know, for instance, Trace City, you know, perhaps you all saw how I fought the uh, railway union to save that plot of land. And if you look at what's going on at Trace, uh, and places like Slintech and there are others, it's just absolutely wonderful, it's brilliant. And I take Jeevan's point, you know, we are not going to compete and create the wealth in this country by producing low complexity products. And that is an uh, important point. Mm -hmm. We cannot be call center operators. We have to make products like Harsha has done or Jeevan has done or others have done, perhaps you all have done. And that is where value is going to be created. So we have to create a highly competitive social market economy. We have to compete in the space that we are not competing in currently. We are currently competing in the price space that is not going to help us shift gears, that will not make this story successful. So that is the point that I'm over and over trying to reiterate where we have to open our minds and reduce our border tariffs and the controls that we have and integrate so that we can bring talent in, our own talent and other talent, and one plus one is not always two. It can be 10 or 15. 
Thank you. Uh, there's a question from, I'd like to see with a question for someone else, because a lot of questions to you, Harsha, obviously. People want to, you know, use the time here to have, you know, get clarity. But here's a question for uh, Jeevan. I saw something for you, just a minute. Um, okay. Uh, here's a question for you. It's heartening to note, that's from Rajendra Tiagaraja. Uh, it's uh, heartening to note that you are championing the birth of a domestic private cloud, which will hopefully reduce cost of computing and processing. However, what is preventing you in doing the same thing in a highly cost-effective jurisdiction such as Singapore, where cost of the cloud is much cheaper than Sri Lanka, and making this infrastructure available at cheaper cost to Lankan businesses? Okay, interesting question. Um, I, I think... Uh, is that correct in the first place, that if you put your stuff on a cloud in Singapore, it'll be cheaper than putting it on a cloud here? Um, I, I think, uh, well, I haven't looked at it in detail, but the connectivity might, might actually be more expensive. Um, but one of the biggest costs in, in, in obviously, a, being a cloud operator is probably the electricity. Um, and our electricity tariffs are um, probably one of the highest in, in the region. Um, 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 unlike India, where it's low but not reliable, here it's high and reliable. Um, I think we need to do a better job of, of reducing the, uh, the electricity costs. But obviously, as a cloud provider, I think we can look at solar and, and renewable energy to to uh, to reduce that that electric those electricity tariffs. Okay, uh, Charlene, there is no question from the audience, but I thought since you're on the panel and also you, Captain, I'll come to you in a minute. Uh, tell me now, irrespective of policy and so on, you have gone out and built a brand that's gone global, at least regional, maybe global. Uh, what is it that you would like to share with the audience? One or two things that made you break out. So that's what it's all about. We are trying to get more and more companies to break out and then hopefully support the export diversification goals that uh, Harsha spoke about. Uh, would you like to share some quick thoughts on what is it that made you successful? Yeah, I think with, um, with Sparcelon, we, we set out and by design, Sparcelon was a brand we created that could be taken out. So we, we designed it here, we, we tweaked it here and then took it out. But what we did is at the design stage itself, we looked at, our, looked at the markets, we looked at the niches that we were going to get into. Because as a, as, as a SME going out, you have to look at niches and look at niche markets and get in there. Because when you get into a niche market, you can control your, your marketing, you can control your spends and then penetrate and then expand. So that's a really great way to get in to foreign markets. So for SMEs, Understanding your market, understanding the markets you're getting into, and looking for those gaps, and then how your brand can fill that gap is one main thing. The other is, of course, uniqueness. Where we're living in a global market today that anything you come up with can be replicated fast and very fast. So you have to be unique or when you enter markets, and you have to keep innovating to stay ahead. So there has to be constant innovation, which is, which is almost on a daily basis. Um, and you have to have that unique identity. And that is a key that comes with the branding function. That's why I'm such an advocate for creating um, good brands, which then translates that you can um, dictate a premium as well. And you're more resilient in the longer term. Talking about brands, Harsha, would you talk about three attributes that might uh, set out Sri Lanka as a brand? I mean, one is our GPS, obviously the strategic uh, positioning, and that um, has to be the main uh, driver. You know, branding, marketing people will know better than me how to get that message across. But that is what is driving uh, the integration. That is why Sri Lanka is uh, uh, unique. Uh, that is why Parakramabha, who did what he did then, that is what Ptolemy talked about. That is where we uh, leverage. That is the, the God's gift to us. And we have to leverage that. And, and, and um, uh, we have to uh, uh, be able to uh, have product come in, go out uh, without hassle. So that must be, that message must go out. So we have to brand ourselves around that. Definitely not wonder of Asia, right? Just kidding. 
no, no, let, let me, let me, let me, let me give you. I'm just having a. No, 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 no. That's okay. Let's move on. I just said in jest because I had to ask a question. No, no. Let me. I want. For me, I don't look at Sri Lanka as part of South Asia. I've said this before. To me, Sri Lanka is the center of the Indian Ocean. If you think about it, you know, it's a brand, different paradigm, right? And that is the attitude that we must take, not just a, a, a regional uh, player, uh, you know, dealing with South of India, but all the way from the Philippines, Australia, Japan, to the, the eastern coast of Africa. So I'm we just wondering the whether the Chinese government is leveraging that position uh, better than we are. But uh, I'll just leave it as a thought. A quick question to, uh, to you, uh, Captain, uh, because you need to ask at least one question because you've been on the panel. I'm sorry. I'll just leave that. <laughs> Uh, you know, the Hambantota port, now Iran in an interview, and Iran was here in the morning, he had said, I think Colombo will continue to be the leading growing port. Hambantota is a buried investment. Now, will there be competition between a port that's largely owned by the government of Sri Lanka and the Hambantota port, which is largely owned by the Chinese? No, we are not going into competition with Colombo. Definitely not. And how it will you avoid it? Um, Colombo basically is going to be a, a, a transshipment port for containers, whereas Hambantota, we are going to uh, concentrate more on industrial port. So there should be a lot of uh, <coughs> industries coming in, setting up their businesses, and growing its own cargo rather than have transshipment. So there will be complementary uh, ports in the country. So there will be no competition between the two ports. And if we do compete, we are going to uh, spit up on our own faces because we have a major terminal ourselves in Colombo. So do, we don't want to do that. So given that the, 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 uh, the prospects are so promising, Harsha, would it have been better for us to have kept the port rather than do an equity swap? You know, you can ask me all these questions to put me, you know, to ridicule me. But no, 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 no. I'm not. No, I'm no, no, that's all right. That's all right. But, you know, we, we have certain capabilities. We think we are so great, but in fact, we are not. We must understand our limitations. If the port authority could have made it into what uh, China Merchant Port and us are going to make it into, they could have, but they couldn't. We don't have the networks. Uh, the China Merchant Port is a leading global player. They have uh, access. They have partnerships. So it is about joining up. It is about merging. It is about creating value by uh, coming together uh, with China Merchant Port to do this. So I agree with him. And what we are trying to do there is an industrial port. There's a 50 square kilometer industrial uh, zone there. It is a special economic zone. The new laws are coming, right? And that will create uh, ease of in and out into that port. We will partner in the intermediate dynamics of uh, regional trade. And that is our, our vision, right? So this will succeed. OK. Uh, there are, there, we have about, uh, I think, five minutes. And there was a question on that point when you said about free uh, uh, zones. There was a question. Unfortunately, the, the, I can't see the questions anymore. I'm so sorry about that. But I do remember a question that came uh, anonym, anonymous, I believe. It said, will the laws of Sri Lanka apply to the port city? We are uh, in the process of finalizing the, the legal framework for port city, so I don't want to jump the gun. However, Nothing we will do at the port city will be contra the constitution. So whatever that we do will be within the, the constitutional framework uh, that applies to the rest of the country. What we want to do is to deal with the issues that you mentioned at the beginning, inconsistency, <coughs> inconsistency in policy, in regulation, in law. So that anyone who comes and invests in Port City will know, by and large, it's English law that applies, right? So 
if you have that peace of mind, right, then you're more likely to make that long-term investment because the investments are safe, right? So we want to, it is almost a policy lab, right? And because I'm chairing the steering committee, it's an absolutely amazing experience also because you are creating something new, right? So when I say a policy lab, we are doing things differently in Port City. And if it works, then we can bring it to the rest of the country, right? And law is, uh, uh, of course, uh, the Sri Lankan law will be supreme, but, but we will have uh, sufficient leeway uh, to ensure the consistency for investors. When you said the law is and stopped, I was wondering if you were going to say the law is an ass. But uh, as the saying goes, anyway, uh, quick question before we wind up, uh, Shivani, because this is an important question, I'll pose it to you because you are the female member of this panel, which is largely dominated by men, sadly. But uh, uh, the, the female participation in the labor force has declined from 41% uh, some years ago to 36% in 2016. And we lag behind other middle income countries. Now, considering that Sri Lanka has a slightly larger percentage of women, as a percentage population, is this, this going to be a drag in the economy when such an important section of the population is not part of the labor force, when it's actually declining? Do you have any ideas about this? Well, I think firstly, uh, Sri Lanka has actually been a trendsetter when it comes to uh, gender equality in education and healthcare. And if you look at the, the human development indices, uh, it has higher female literacy and higher life expectancy than many of our neighbors. Uh, we have been able to achieve gender equality when it comes to primary education as well as tertiary education. But uh, unfortunately, this has not translated to greater female participation uh, in the labor force. And of course, there is a strong case for it. Uh, there is a recent study which indicates that the per capita income of uh, Sri Lanka could be higher by 20% if we can just get that gender equality going. Uh, we also know that, uh, that uh, working women tend to spend a lot more of their income on the health and nutrition and education of their children. So this is really something, uh, a case uh, to, uh, to push for and drive for. Uh, now what is really holding this back? I think it is driven by the socioeconomic ethos of, uh, of uh, many countries uh, like Sri Lanka. And uh, by addressing some of those issues, uh, we would be able to encourage female participation, whether it is uh, the, the entrepreneurship programs, whether it is about providing more flexible arrangements or even providing childcare facilities. Thank you. And just to wind up, and uh, we might run a few minutes late, I'll ask each of the speakers to take a minute to give your thoughts, a quick final thought on the topic, slow to fast track. And Harsha, if you don't mind, I'd like you to go last so that you can, you know, uh, with you, Tommy. Well, I think this uh, is pretty apt for the Port City because uh, what we have gone through over the last couple of years is probably the slow part, that's the construction, the reclamation. Going forward, I think uh, that's where we are coming to the city uh, development itself. Uh, and once we can put some of these buildings together, uh, people will see the benefit that the Port City will bring to the country and I think people will rally around it and support it. Yeah, we uh, came in from the fast track in Colombo to the slow track in Hambantota. Um, so we are waiting to uh, get things going in Hambantota. So let's hope that uh, uh, legislation would be eased off and uh, ease of doing business would come in uh, much faster than uh, everybody is expecting so that uh, we can fast track uh, development in the southern province. I think we need to further leverage the good that we have. I think uh, the opportunity here lies not just in the size of the country, but in the stage of socioeconomic development. And uh, this is something which is a big opportunity for us. Um, for the IT BPM industry, we are actually moving from IT BPM to knowledge and innovation. Um, and that kind of sums up our brand, which we launched a few months ago called the Island of Ingenuity. Where, um, where we are moving up the value chain, um, as, as you know, uh, spoken by Peter and, and Harsha, um, not only looking at the low-end stuff, but trying to productize, trying to uh, do data science and AI, robotics, et cetera. So I think that will really accelerate growth in the next few years for us to reach our $5 billion target. Um, SMEs have a vital role to play in um, really pushing export growth. 
And uh, the way to do it is to look beyond commodity and uh, to look at value added and brands. Uh, we need to look at branding our products and services as individual companies and uh, Sri Lanka needs to look at branding uh, as a whole as well. Harsha. Um, what I said at the very beginning is as a nation, we are hitting speed bumps. We are hitting speed bumps uh, because we are having unsustainable large current account deficits which leads to a lot of <coughs> dollar denominated debt that has huge repercussions, has uh, huge cost of living, socio-economic problems associated with the value of the currency and so on. So as a policy maker, what we have to do is to ensure not to reduce income or rather imports, but to ensure that we have sufficient exports to maintain that level of imports, which is almost a given when the country grows. So we have no option but to integrate further with regional and global production networks. And there, the problem is we are still unfortunately stuck in low complexity, low value products, bar a few that we see moving up. So we have to change to higher productivity, higher complexity, higher value added products to export. So that cannot be done totally uh, domestically. We have to open our minds, we have to open our borders, we have to integrate and that is the way and that we are going to fill the glass that he has built. Thank you. And I'll end with the, with the report that you spoke about, Harsha, the Center for International Development, Harvard University. They spoke about a thing called the growth syndrome, and they said these binding constraints that stop us from diversifying exports and in bringing FDI is due to underlying causes, and I'm quoting straight from the report, uh, which is what is called the growth syndrome. And they say facing Sri Lanka is a problem of extremely high fragmentation in policy making and policy implementation. There's a critical lack of government coordination between a very large number of ministries within brackets 50, as well as numerous boards and agencies. While I completely appreciate and understand that you are part of a coalition government, and while you have brought about a great democratic space for public debate and political activity, I certainly hope that you will be able to uh, pull uh, the necessary levers and, and the right policies in place. And I go back to the quote which says, Sri Lanka's ability to grow faster and more sustainably will depend on the success of the government in continuing to address the binding constraints and the underlying government coordination problem. I wish you all the very best, and I hope you will continue to strive to make the Sri Lankan economy and its people better. Oh, did I? I'm quoting verbatim. Yeah, but you, you have to also read what they say about the other binding constraint. There's not, not only one binding constraint. Well, there's land. What about the exports? That is the major The whole constraint. report is about, okay. So I'll let you say the last word. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, on that note, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the fellow panelists. Uh, I, wish, I wish you all the best for a, for a great uh, session ahead today and tomorrow. And uh, let's hope this is all, all the work that you're doing at the chamber and this summit will only pull ourselves all together to make Sri Lanka a better place for all of us. Thank you very much.